Dino Varelli. I'm the founder and CEO of Project Purple. What inspired you to create Project Purple? Uh, my dad, though he was my main inspiration. I mean, there were so many uh, points uh, or things that came up that inspired me, but my dad uh, was the main inspiration and the, and the initial first inspiration to start Project Purple. Can you tell me a little bit about your dad? Yeah, yeah. So my dad uh, was an immigrant. Uh, my mom and dad came to the United States from Italy in 1968. They, uh, they landed in the Bronx. Uh, and then uh, after a short two year stint there, they, they eventually moved up to Connecticut for work and for lifestyle um, and started a family. I have an older brother who was born in 1970 in Connecticut. So that's why I, I remember that date pretty well. Um, then I was born in 1974 and uh, my dad was a laborer. He, he worked for the laborers union. He was, uh, I like to say a jack of all trades. He was involved in construction his whole life here in the United States. Uh, he dabbled in plumbing. He never really got into electrical, uh, but he was great at carpentry, great at masonry, and did that up until his retirement. And then he uh, continued to work post-retirement um, for himself and for other folks, uh, but retired from his union job and then um, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in December of 2000 and, uh, 2008. Um, and then that's when his kind of his cancer journey started and, and kind of where the inspiration to start Project Purple came from. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about Project Purple? Yeah. So uh, Project Purple, as I said, was uh, was born out of the inspiration of my dad. Uh, my dad was diagnosed in December of 08. He had surgery right before Chris, right, right before Christmas. And then um, he ended up. Uh, going through like six months of chemo and then he was given like a cancer free diagnosis and I was never a runner. And, and, um, during that time, I mean, 2008, you know, the stock market had crashed. I was in the financial service business and I had two boys under three, or excuse me, under four, actually. I had a two year old, well, technically under five, but I had a two and a two year old and a four year old. So life was busy. Uh, I was running my own insurance brokerage had five employees and, um, uh, you know, the reality of my dad's diagnosis, I just started to run and running became very therapeutic to me, it became very positive for me. And so as my dad's cancer journey was somewhat on pause because he was given this like, you know, hey, you don't have cancer, you can go about living your life, you know, the way it was before cancer, but that wasn't really the reality for us because my dad had a lot of complications from surgery, from chemo. And so he never was really right again, I guess I would say from, from that, you know, original diagnosis and his treatments. And then fast forward to March of 2010, he was re-diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, but this time stage four and was given a very, uh, you know, daunting outlook, you know, only six months to live. So that's when the running kind of started to really kind of ratchet up. And uh, during that time, you know, in the spring of 2010, I just, uh, you know, from the very beginning, I actually, because I had my own business, I took a step away from the business to just be the chauffeur for my mom and dad. As I mentioned, my mom and dad were immigrants. Uh, they put my brother and I through, uh, you know, parochial school um, and then eventually through college and, and private high school. I mean, I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So, you know, the public school system wasn't that great, but, you know, faith was a big part of our family growing up. So just naturally parochial school all the way through high school and then um, through college. And so when my dad got sick and I think also being a, a, a young dad myself, I just found this different appreciation for my dad and especially my parents. Right. Uh, as you become a parent for those listening and watching that. Uh, you know, know what that what that means as, as you become a young parent and then you, you find this like different appreciation for your parents and, and the things they did for you and, and the stress you put them through. Right. Um, and so when my dad got sick, I was like, all right, I, I can't I'm not trained in the medicine, you know, the medical field. What can I do? And I was like, you know what? I can just be the chauffeur. And so being the chauffeur and, and going to everything. And just seeing everything from kind of a different lens, Michael, um, you know, just as that caregiver and, and, you know, listening and seeing things differently than my mom and my dad would, right? Because you're, you know, the patient's worried about fighting the cancer, the caregiver's worried about, you know, the, the patient and how their life's going to be impacted by this. 
like I, I was the chauffeur. I dropped them off. I stayed with them. I supported them. But I went home to my family, right, and my 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 unit, right, which was different. You know, our our lives were extremely different. We were impacted by my dad's disease naturally because he was such a big part of my family, my wife, my kids. But really, um, you know, life was somewhat normal for us. But, you know, being that third person and being the chauffeur, you just see so many different things on how cancer impacts a person and their family. And so through that time in the spring of 2010, I just uh, there were so many little things that had happened. And, uh, you know, but my dad was still the big inspiration, right? Like curing my dad and helping my dad. And, you know, so running was just so positive to me. Um, I think being a serial entrepreneur that I consider myself, I looked at the pancreatic cancer space and cancer as a whole and, and saw like groups using running, other groups not using running. And then I envisioned kind of like what running was for me, um, you know, providing that outlet and just the positivity of it. I was like, hey, I want to give this back. And and I knew like a couple of things. I knew there were strength in numbers. I knew we had to raise a lot of awareness. I wasn't too worried about like money at first, just kind of like the irony of it, right? Because you can't really do anything with money. But I was just like, right. hey, like if we can raise awareness and inspire people and provide this positive outlet, like the rest will follow. Like that's kind of was like my methodology at the time and my mindset. And so we literally just started running. I, I started running events and we launched Project Purple in September of 2010, 2010. at a at a local race here in Connecticut. And um here in the podcast studio, I've got I got photos of me the first time, you know, the first uh finish line crossing with my two little boys. They they joined me like they jumped out onto the course, which you're not supposed to do, but I guess when you're crossing the finish line with two little kids, you know, two and four, no one's really going to arrest you or, you know, tell you to get yeah, off the right. course, right? Nowadays, you can't, you know, nowadays it's harder to do that. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of the first event that kicked things off and, you know, running because it was so positive to me during that time um, really became kind of part of the foundation here at Project Purple about what we do and how we do it. Yeah, how important is it? for someone going through this, not only the person, but the family to have a support system? Uh, I, I think, you know, this is now going on 15 years. So I speak from, a, from I guess I would say experience, right? From what I've gone through and, and not to preach or to tell anyone, but, you know, I think um, experience matters, um, you know, especially in this disease. I, I think support is like one of those pillars. There's There's a couple pillars. And, you know, no one should ever fight alone. And that's something that we try to do here at Project Purple is provide support. Um, and part of that's through our financial aid program, through our meal assistance program, through our blanket program. So I, I, I think support is critical, um, but not everyone has like a big family. Not everyone has a lot of friends, but that doesn't mean you can't find support in groups like ours and others that provide support to patients. And I think that's critical. And, and a lot of the cancer centers are, are very, a lot of the, the big cancer centers, I should say, um, have support systems built in where, you know, they have support groups and they have support systems built into place. So I think it's critical for patients and their families to kind of, I, I know people, um, I guess I would say, Michael, to end the, you know, the support question here, not to ramble here, but uh, you can see I'm kind of passionate about support. Um, you know, there's this thing of acceptance. And I think um, sometimes people are very prideful that they can accomplish things on their own. A cancer journey, like sometimes you got to check your ego at the door, like accept the, the, the help. Like you're still going to be fighting. You're still going to be doing the treatments yourself. But there's a lot of other things that you can accept support for. Um, you know, whether that's meals, whether that's transportation, whether that's like just everyday living tasks that, you know, there's groups that will help you with that support in that. Those, I think, are things that are very powerful to get support on. And there's nothing, you know, there's nothing shameful or, you know, there's nothing like, you know, you're like you're ruining your pride if you're accepting meals, uh, you know, because you can't cook your meals for you because you're so beat up, you know. Right. So support is very critical. And, and I think that also goes from, you know, support from caregivers, just being there for the people and being, you know, as normal as possible, I think is is very uh, critical as well. You 
just touched on it a little bit, but uh, could you tell me more details about your programs? Yeah. So, you know, um, the patient financial aid program has been with us since day one. And that was, I think, something that we, um, you know, realized early on. And so we have two programs that uh, support pancreatic cancer as a whole. I should say support the pancreatic cancer community as a whole. The first one is patient uh, support. Uh, which comes in the line of patient financial aid. So anyone battling pancreatic cancer can apply for a financial aid grant where we will help support pay their utilities, their housing, mortgage or rent, or medical copay. We never send money to the patients. It always goes to the lenders and debtors. Patients are always CC'd on everything so they know what's going on. They're fully communicated. Um, and then within that program and patient financial support or patient support, we also have a meal assistance program. And this really came out of Michael, the last like really three years of inflation, you know, where we've seen yeah. just like inflation on everything, like from ketchup to eggs to meat, um, you name it has gone up exponentially. Right. And, and that's a real, those are real problems. Right. And, and actually someone facing a cancer diagnosis, that's a real tough pill to swallow, especially for a lot of people in, in this cancer just don't work, right? They can't work any longer because of the treatments and because of the disease. So um, we were really excited. This was a request for a long, long time. Last year, we forged a partnership with a great partner out of the Boston area, uh, Nutri Meat Plans, and we're providing healthy, nutritious meals to patients um, all across the um, from, I, I should say not all across, but from Maine to Florida, uh, their footprints uh, geographically a little limited. We do support people all around the country financially, but when it comes to our meal system assistance program, their footprint covers Maine to Florida as far west as Ohio. Uh, so we, we have some limitations in that program, but then we also provide blankets. Uh, so we've sent over 5,000 blankets nationwide to patients going through uh, pancreatic cancer. And you might say, what's a blanket do? Well, it provides hope, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, and we also provide information on our, our meal assistance and also our financial aid assistance program. Um, you know, so patients become aware of those programs because um, not everyone knows that we have those programs and the blanket programs are a great way to introduce those programs to patients. But also um, we know that, you know, I, I said this before, you know, there's, there's support and there's strength in numbers so by providing a blanket from a complete, you know, to a complete stranger from a group that has no, uh, you know, introduction or has, uh, you know, the, the patients don't know about Project Purple is very powerful um, and to let them know that they're not alone. So that's our patient program. And then the other program that uh, our efforts support is research. And that's something that we've been really over the last couple of years, as we've continued to grow and raise millions of dollars, we've continued to put more dollars into research. It's a, uh, it's critical. We need early detection. We need better treatments. And so that's a part where we, we are hopefully doing our part uh, and with what we can control with the dollars we invest back into research. So I see behind you, you have an awesome setup for, uh, for podcasts. Can you tell me a little bit about your podcast? Yeah. So, uh, I get a lot of crazy. They're not crazy. There's just I get a lot of ideas. And I don't know, maybe just being the entrepreneur, you know, since I started Project Purple, um, you know, I've traveled pretty extensively around around the world, not just around the country. But recently over the last couple of years, has been really blessed to bring me over to Europe for events, for research. And so uh about eight years ago, because we're almost on seven years on this podcast. It might even be further along, like nine years ago, traveling a ton. And, you know, you get, you know, and again, let's put this in perspective. Like now everyone's got a podcast. And I mean, everybody, right? But 10 years ago, no one was podcast. I mean, some right. people were, right? Like the Rogans and, you know, the Hubermans and some of these guys that have, you know, built really like these huge Lewis Howes, you know, another guy. And so, uh, you know, I, I, someone, I was just tired of listening to like audiobooks and like music and, you know, just being on the, you know, doing a lot of flight miles. Someone was like, Hey, have you ever listened to podcasts? I was like, no, what the hell's a podcast? <laughs> and so I go into like Apple podcasts and I search pancreatic cancer and nothing comes up. Actually, excuse me. One does come up from Johns Hopkins. And it was like two doctors talking about the Whipple, which is, you know, one of the few surgeries that a patient with pink that's diagnosed with pancreatic cancer 
you know, only one in five are eligible for it, but it is like one of the surgeries that's available for patients. And it was just so like medical and it was like really monotone. And I'm like, this sucks. I'm like, you know, if you're a patient, you know, and here we are, you know, again, this wasn't, I mean, it wasn't that far ago. I mean, like eight years, nine years, isn't that far back. And I was like, you know, technology, you know, with our advances in technology, I'm like, you know, maybe there's an opportunity here to raise awareness. So we went out, we put out, uh, you know, we work, we we're in Connecticut. We're really fortunate to have a lot of great universities really near us. Uh, we started a, a really robust internship program back in like 2014, 2000 and, uh, like 13. And we've always kind of embraced our interns and, and always kind of like try to give them special projects and, and have something like really meaningful with what we do here at Project Purple. And so we put it out to our intern distribution list, like looking for someone who's done a podcast to start help start a podcast. And we were really blessed and fortunate uh, that a kid from a local college, you know, answered that call and was uh, was doing like a sports podcast for, you know, personal use at college. And we said, hey, what do you think if we start this one for pancreatic cancer? And the whole idea was to raise awareness and just another medium to do that. And I've said a lot of things in the past, you know, 15 years, Michael. But one of the things I, I always kind of come back to is I, I believe I have the best job in the world. And I'm not just saying that. I truly believe that. I love what I do. It never feels like work. Some days it does. But, you know, I get to talk to researchers that are on the front lines, clinicians, oncologists, surgeons, bench work researchers. I get to talk to participants who are raising, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars for us, doing these amazing feats. And I get to talk to the survivors, the people that we consider daily inspiration, you know, along with the other two groups, but those folks more so because that's what we're striving for is survivorship, right? And I think the challenging piece that we've always had, and I sometimes have is like, how do you articulate that? And also, I was a marketing major, and I think like kudos to uh, my marketing professor back at Roger Williams University. I did get my degree in marketing, but you know I do remember this in class. You know, everyone learns differently, and you know from a marketing perspective, you got to hit all those mediums right. Some people like to hear, some people like to watch, and other people like to read. Right. So the podcast for us when we launched was like that audio piece. But what the really cool thing at least for me, and still is to this day, is like, I get to ask the questions and the people that are so inspiring get to answer them. And you're hearing it from the horse's mouth, as they say, right? Like, it's not Project Purple articulating what it means to be, you know, a cancer researcher or a surgeon or an oncologist or a participant or a survivor. It's the person themselves. Yeah. And that was really cool. And, and, you know, when we launched, it was just video. I mean, excuse me, just audio. It's wild, the evolution. Like, yeah, you said, like, we've got, I'm in the studio. We've got all this equipment. But, like, early on, we had, like, a, a mic that, and we did everything in person. Yeah. It was, like, this microphone in the middle. I remember, like, one of our first few episodes, we were in New York City, and we, we interviewed this uh, survivor that was going through it along with his partner. And we're literally sitting in a park with the mic and a, and a laptop and headphones and you know there's like ambulances going by like it's just crazy like it was just crazy 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 and you know we we're just trying to get that audio right and then COVID came and we started to utilize zoom and what's crazy is like in 2020 like we weren't recording we were you know, we were on there recording the audio, but we weren't using the video. And I was like, guys, like we missed like such a great yeah. opportunity because like video really wasn't pushed until like, you know, 2022. And then now, you know, now today everything's video, right? It's like all about reels and everything. So now yeah. we're doing it all right. But what, what happened also in 2020 was when we started to go to Zoom, we were getting people from all over the world. I mean, like literally like Australia, Europe, like it was just so fascinating what was happening like really quick for us. So like we've interviewed, like we're, we're over 300 episodes like booked. Like um, I think we're, the team is like watching those episodes, but we recorded them. And like, we've had people from all over the world. And what happened during COVID Michael was like, people started reaching out to us 
And when I, when we started at day one, I was like, Hey, we're going to fill this thing up with inspiration. I want to be inspired and, and, you know, talking to people in those various fields, you know, participants, survivors, um, and then, you know, clinicians in their various fields. And, and it's been wild. And, and, you know, I think we've had over 150, like half of those episodes have been with su survivors. And I've always said like, everyone's journey is different. Um, everyone's story is different. Our job is to help share that in hopes of raising awareness and, you know, maybe someone on the other side, if and when they get diagnosed, if they do, like the benefit is that they listen to the Project Purple podcast from XYZ survivors sharing like what they went through. And that person realizes that like day one when they have the signs and symptoms and they go to their clinician or their general practitioner and, you know, they get diagnosed early and they have a, a success story as well. So that's been the really cool thing with the podcast and how it got started. You know, if you did ask me, you know, seven years ago, like, hey, do you envision yourself, you know, continuing this thing? Because there was a point in time I was like, are we really like, like, is anyone listening? <laughs> you know, are, are people like tuning in? And, you know, from time to time, like we get emails from people like talking, whether it's like DMs or emails, like how inspiring it is or like, you know, hey, like my mom just went through this, like listen to your podcast and like the irony of like going through this or just the numbers. Like we surpassed over a hundred thousand plays like last year. It was just really cool to wow. have that um, and know that people are tuning in and, and, you know, now with video, like some of the YouTube metrics are just like off the charts, like people watching. And so like we're seeing, you know, the fruits of the labor and the, all the hard work that we've put in, um, that it matters. What is it like for you uh, getting to know survivors and building relationships with them? Um, it's hard. And and I'll say hard. And because like I lost my dad, Michael, and, and you know, I, I like, listen, there's days when uh, I'd give it all away. I give it all back to have my dad. Right. And as a parent, you know, I have, my boys are now 20 and, and 18. So I, uh, I don't reflect often, uh, but recently I had a guest on and this came up, um, you know, and, and he's a survivor, superhuman, and, um, he's a parent as well. And his kids are a little bit older, but he has one that's a little bit younger. Um, so they're kind of in between. And, and, and so, um, but I'm blessed to have met so many people that have come through my life. So uh, there's certain days that I feel like it's a blessing and it's super inspiring to meet survivors. And I'm really blessed that I have this, this platform and, and, you know, this community. Uh, but also other days, uh, it's really hard, uh, not only from the reality of my own personal experience, but the reality of the cancer. You know, um, unfortunately, people come into my life from that standpoint at probably the lowest of their life. Right. So I think there's um, there's some specialness in that, Michael, that um, people are very vulnerable in the sense that like, they can't sugarcoat like, Hey, you're, you've got pancreatic cancer. It's, it's a very like surreal. It's very like, it's there. So I, I guess I see like people really in a very different way that probably other people that have come into their life or been in their lives have seen them. Um, I see that as a gift though. Right. Cause it's kind of hard to sugarcoat and bullshit your way. Excuse my language. No, like, hey, please. <laughs> hey, that, that someone's, someone's coming to me for assistance. So they're not going to BS me that they have pancreatic cancer. Like they're pretty open and honest and you get to see people in a very vulnerable way, which is really kind of, I think, special. If that makes sense. Like, you, I, yeah. like I'm not like when I was in the insurance business, like I'd meet people and you know, you could, you could smell the BS, you know, coming out. Or you just know, like, these guys are BSing you, like, whatever. But, like, here you meet people, like, it's so genuine, I guess, is yeah. what I'm trying to say, which is really special. Like, you, you you get people on a very human level, man, which is, like, you know, look at the, the world we're in right now. Like, social media, to me, like, is fake, right? Like, you see everyone's successes. You don't see reality. And right. we have parts of society that think that's reality, right? Like, look, like, <laughs> we're not, I get do we want to go down this road? Uh, like, you know, what the media portrays celebrities and politicians as being certain people and they're not. 
I don't, I don't get that. Right. I get that very, like people are coming to me, like, you know, they're real as can be, man. So we, we get, a, you, you, you get away from like trying to be something you're not like that doesn't happen. So it, to me, it's a gift, like to be able to meet people at that level and skip all the BS is, is, is super, super, uh, powerful, but also, uh, pretty special. Yeah. Those conversations are way more important because they do feel real. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like I was in the financial service business for almost 11 years and like, you know, you'd have like five conversations with someone, you know, and they're still throwing, you know, mud at you trying to like blow smoke up your butt or whatever, trying to say how great they are. Okay. Like, let's move on. <laughs> let's get to the deal, you know, here, whereas here it's just a much different uh, level of, uh, of communication, I think, which is really powerful. Well, you do a lot to help others, but what do you do to help your own mental health? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I try to work out like at least five to six days a week. I don't have many off days. Uh, very big on my recovery. Do a lot of stretching, yoga, uh, cold plunging when it's available. Uh, I'm very big into recovery modalities. I do not drink alcohol. Um, I, you know, and that I'm, Hey, listen, I, I'm not here to preach, but you do you and I do me. Uh, I think, you know, just, uh, from what I know, like alcohol just does not, and I'm not saying like, Hey, like, like, I'm just not the kind of guy, like if we go out socially, uh, with friends and family that like, hey, I have to have a drink to relax. Like I can re relax without alcohol. So I just am very conscious of that uh, because uh, just like I just don't like the feeling of being hungover and also the effects that alcohol has on your body. Um, also do a lot of meditation, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, um, you know, I've just got into meditating. Um, I don't go to church regularly, but for me, faith has been kind of a thing that, again, as I mentioned from the very beginning, like my parents raised me in this Roman Catholic faith yeah. um, and it's something that I've never forgotten. And it's something that I know is a big part of who I am. So um, I think having faith is really important, um, whether you believe in whatever faith that may be, um, just to practice it. And, I, and to me, practice doesn't mean like, hey, I have to go to uh, the place of worship. You can do that from your home. You can do it before you go to bed. You can do it right when you get up. I think the other piece to this, and, and maybe I should have started with this, is just being routine and sticking to those routines and being consistent in that. Yes, travel, life, vacation, all that stuff comes into life, right? But you have to find consistency. Um, and it's okay, you know, if you're on vacation to not have to work out every day or get up at five in the morning and, you know, have that routine. Um, I think also for, for from a personal standpoint is just, you know, limiting your intake of what's out there socially. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not really good at it sometimes, but sometimes I think we, excuse me, can all get caught up in that. But I just think limiting like what you what you bring in. Um, and I guess that goes along that same thing of just like watching what I eat and and also what I put into my body, um, I think is also important to put in into your mindset. I do read quite a bit when I have the opportunity, like an audiobook. Um, I love like breaking open uh, an, a hard copy book. I'm just looking over at the, the desk here in the studio. Like I got a couple books here that I gotta, I, I'd love to break into hopefully when I start hitting the road here in a little while. Uh, for travel. But um, I think all those things kind of matter. But I think going back to what I just said, like just consistency or routine and trying to really limit like what you're doing, um, you know, from a from a recovery standpoint and then also from a mental standpoint, I think is really, really critical. And I think the other piece to this, and I think, Michael, as a society, like we're really I don't know, there's some stigma in it, and, and, you know, like mental health gets kind of beat up quite a bit. And yeah. I think it gets abused a bit, but I think just having conversations with people that you trust, like I have people in my circle, uh, my support staff that, you know, there's sometimes that we have like really hard conversations with, whether those are friends or, you know, my spouse um, or coworkers for that matter, um, you know, that, that you can have that dialogue with like, Hey, something's bothering me or like, Hey, how do we handle this situation? You know, I think is important, you know, to have support like that. Not everyone has that in their family and, that's okay. There's like plenty of professionals and I've done, 
you know, a lot of uh, coaching uh, with outside professionals as well when when the time was right and when it was necessary. So I think, you know, there, there's that's another big piece of that is too, is like kind of talk these things through, you know, from a mental aspect to, to kind of better yourself. Where do you want to see Project Purple in the next, say, three to five years? I'd love to see us to continue to grow and continue to support patients and their families and continue to support the research efforts. Um, you know, I'm not naive to the fact like, uh, you know, I, I, I think we'll be in business still, I hope. Um, in some aspects, but I also hope that there's like some major developments in cancer as a whole where, you know, we're starting to see less and less cases, but unfortunately the reality is that it's going in the other direction. Like we're starting to see more and more cases you know, for a variety of reasons. So I think we're going to be in business for a long, long time, at least, you know, in my lifetime here. So continue to grow, um, continue to support patients. I think, you know, the meal assistance program was a great pivot for us, you know, where we kind of pivoted, we saw an opportunity to support more patients, you know, in the nutrition space. Um, you know, there's other opportunities, hopefully, um, you know, as, as things kind of arise, if there's a, a challenge that, the community seems that we need to help solve and hopefully we pivot and you know can support patients and their families in that aspect as well i will say this though in, in terms of what we do you know there's this thing like you got to be really 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 good before you're you're great and i think we're good i don't think we're really really good um so i you know personally and and you know um you know holistically as i run the organization I think we just got to continue to get really, really good and, and eventually be great at what we do across the board, you know, whether that's someone coming to fundraise for us, whether that's a run, whether that's pickleball, whether that's, you know, golf, all the things we do or and, you know, whatever else that evolves to. And also from our programs, like being really, really good at what we do and supporting patients with our programs, and then also being really, really good at supporting researchers and continuing to support those researchers in the research that, um, you know, they, they will conduct. How can people reach out and learn more? Well, socially, we're everywhere. So whether you're on TikTok, Instagram, X, Facebook, YouTube, we're there. So just search for Project Purple. I know on some of the platforms, I think on YouTube, uh, it's like run for, or, uh, you know, LinkedIn as well. I should say, you know, we're, we're, uh, it's either run for project purple or project purple. Um, and then, um, you know, naturally via the World Wide web, um, if you go to our website, which is www.projectpurple.org, which can link you to all those social locations as well. Um, wherever you listen to podcasts, naturally we're, we've got our podcasting as well. So uh, wherever you are, I, I think that's something that I, you know, our marketing team, I don't take credit for, but the marketing team here has done a great job, you know, working with the staff and, and trying to really be wherever people are in terms of connecting. 